that first brought you to Abercorn House, said Old Anne, as she went to the door to deliver the stray pigeon to its owner. Yes, I said, a little pathetically for Anne's taste, and with thought too deep for tears, at least in her company. I looked round the kitchen, remember the glory that was Abercorn, Philip, Jessie, Roland, Aurelius. It was no unselfish memory, for I wished with all my heart that I was fifteen again, that the month was April, the hour noon, and the scene in the yard of Abercorn House, with the family assembled, the dogs, Aurelius, Mr. Torrance, there being some days left of the Easter holidays, yes, and Higgs also, and most certainly the respectable Mr. Stoddam. Edward Thomas published his only full novel, The Happy-Go-Lucky Morgans, in 1913. In this talk, I argue that the novel and its character of Aurelius, the su superfluous man, played a pivotal role in Thomas's ability to turn to poetry. Aurelius, who is an itinerant visitor to the Morgan family home, represented the world of the imagination, beauty and heroism, in contrast with the world of fact and commerce that Thomas had occupied as a reviewer and a countryside writer. Thinking through Aurelius gave Thomas permission to write about himself. Thomas thought of himself as like Aurelius and that he lacked the disposition that would allow him to prosper because he was concerned with the aesthetic and spiritual aspects of life over and above his material circumstances. During the first decades of the 1900s, Thomas observed that the spirit of liberal individualism was increasingly hostile to difference, and that this accelerated as the national project was that of avoiding a supposed racial degeneration that would lead to Britain's demise as a global power. Through Aurelius and other characters from the happy-go-lucky Morgans that Thomas based on people he had known in his childhood, and on aspects of himself that he seemed to have suppressed, Thomas came to see that his superfluous man, unlike his ancestor in Russian literature was necessary for the flourishing of civilization. Aurelius and the numerous other poets, misfits and wanderers who appeared in the novel were essential to the life of its imaginary world. At the time of writing, efforts to create a welfare system through the medicalization of social difference contributed to the moral marginalization of those who had formerly been treated with tolerance. Utilitarian spirit meant that the individual could be sacrificed for what was thought of as a greater economic good. Thomas's novel, however, suggested that the economic good was based on an overly narrow concept of value. The happy-go-lucky Morgans also demonstrated a growing recognition at the time that fictional characters should be seen not merely as vehicles for carrying the author's thematic interests or driving the plot. Instead, the reality of characters may be understood in terms of their interdependence both with each other and with the reader. This means that we need to give life to what might be thought of as minor characters, to Aurelius and to the servants, children, lodgers, dogs, and even pi pigeons that inhabit Obercoran House, so that we recognise the truth of the maxim derived from Aurelius's possible namesake, Marcus Aurelius. As Guy Cuthbertson has noted, the Stoic truth, as opposed to the Epicurean state sentiment that seemed to dominate Thomas's era, was that 
That which is not for the interest of the whole swarm is not for the interest of a single bee. I argue that rather than lacking a coherent point of view, as some reviewers have suggested, the novice power lies in its creation of an imaginary world in which the superfluous, those who depend on others for their survival, had a home that they had lost in the real world. The happy-go-lucky Morgans was dedicated to Edward Thomas's mother and father. In a letter to his friend Gordon Bottomley, he described it as half memory, half fancy, and a Welsh family, mostly memory, inhabiting it, and collecting a number of men and boys, including some I knew when I was from 10 to 15. To the extent that it was fiction, it exaggerated the qualities of the real-life characters, and his own childhood was not happy-go-lucky, although it was sometimes happy. In that same letter, Thomas explained that he felt he had achieved something new in his work, since it allowed him to create greater continuity between events and characters. Aurelius is introduced to the Morgan household through the narrator, and unlike the adult, other adult male characters in the novel, he has no title. He came, he is described as coming and going to visit the Morgans at random, and we are told that he writes poetry. When he is described by outsiders, he is treated with derision, but as he has, is to the narrator Arthur, he is the first man I ever met who really proved that man is above other animals as an animal. He was really better than any pony or hound or bird of prey in their own way. He is described as having been an undergardener, a book sales assistant, a trainer to a troop of dogs in a travelling circus, as a waiter, a commercial traveller and a sailor. It isn't clear who the real life Aurelius might have been, and it seems possible that he is one who is entirely a fiction, or a fiction made of other fictions. Guy Cuthbertson, Guy Cuthbertson suggested that he might have been based on Thomas's friend from the 1890s, the poet Charles Dahlman, who is elsewhere compared by Thomas to the 17th century cleric poet Robert Herrick. Unlike the real-life Dalman or Herrick, we are told that Aurelius has obscure origins. He is described as a gypsy and an Italian, and yet knows the ancient stories of Wales. He presents himself as begotten out of the moonlight by an owl's hooting. We are told that he has no perception of religion, although the narrator describes him as one of those who invented God and all the gods and godlets. Others say that he has something wrong with him, that he is clean like a woman. While unlike Thomas in other respects, Aurelius seems to epitomise aspects of what he saw as his deficits, that he too had something wrong with him. Thomas was described once by a school friend as exceptionally quiet and reserved, but was critical of his own self-consciousness because, according to his own standards, this was a sign of either vanity or wickedness. In general, however, he did not write about himself as himself until just before he began writing poetry. His, in his inhibition meant that he wrote about himself through aliases and doubles, including the characters of Philip and Arthur in the happy-go-lucky Morgans. In this talk, I argue that Thomas began to see his reserve as resulting from a constitutional difference of temperament and ideology from his peers. As this difference became more pronounced by historical circumstances, he began to see its potential as a justification for his writing. Edward Thomas did not wish to cast others in his own image, as he saw others doing. In his 1909 work, The South Country, his fictional alter ego is spiritually unable to join in with his peers, who seem to find strength in mocking those they regarded as beneath them. In Thomas's other incomplete autobiographical fiction, also written around this time, he wrote about describe preparing for the civil service exam and his fear of being buried alive as a civil servant or becoming like his peers, who he thought possessed vacuity without leisure, indolence without refinement. In his 1909 countryside book, The South Country, Thomas described himself as the apparent real life narrator as both superfluous and unfortunate and depending on sanitation, improved housing, police charities and medicine for survival. His use of the term superfluous at this time may connect to the English version of Turgenev's story, The Diary of the Superfluous Man, which had been translated recently by Constance Garnett. In The Happy-Go-Lucky Morgans, it is Aurelius who is described as superfluous, and as I go on to explain in further details, Aurelius is central to Thomas's move to writing about himself as himself. This is because Aurelius allowed Thomas the space to imaginatively connect his spiritual 
and literary interests, even if the move was not one that he'd explicitly set out to make. Through Aurelius, Thomas connected his love of nature with a sense of anxiety about the future of people such as himself, who he thought lacked the social sense and, what he called in the South Country, those strong tastes and impulses which, blinding men to what does not concern them, enables them to live with a high heart. Others have previously observed that in the lead-up to World War I, the relative decline in paid-for writing meant that Thomas had a chance to explore new forms of writing. Through them, he seems to have been, wanted to be able to write his self back into existence. This is a period in which he wrote four works of autobiography, the essay Ecstasy, the travel books In Pursuit of Spring and the Ignilled Way, and his critical biography of his earlier hero, Walter Pater. Through the countryside books and autobiography, especially How I Began and The Childhood of Edward Thomas, he started to talk about himself as himself, which meant that he could communicate directly with the reader. However, Thomas's reviewers, as Thomas himself, seemed to have thought that his first novel was lacking. He, wrote, he talked about it as little more than a series of essays rather than a novel, but in its fragmentary state and his focus on placing real characters, he achieved something of the ideas that were later taken to define the modern novel. Through bringing to life the character of Aurelius and the conditions that led to his disappearance, Thomas epitomises the attitudes of the emerging Georgian, Georgian social order. It was December in 1910 that Virginia Woolf famously attributed with the change in human character, which required a subsequent change in the novel to accommodate it. This was when, according to Woolf, relations between masters and servants, husbands and wives, parents and children had shifted. She wrote in her essay, Mr. Brennett and Mrs. Brown, that when human relation change, there is at the same time a change in religion, conduct, politics and literature. Wolf didn't say whether these were negative or positive changes, but it comes clear that the value of the modern novel was to her the ability to show the results of this upheaval on the individual spirit, rather than to describe the changes that would be necessary to remedy it. The capacity she discerned in certain Victorian novels and the literature of the New Georgian period was that characters were drawn from many different social spheres and given reality rather than reduced to their social role. But she thought that in the Georgian era, it was no longer possible to suggest that the communal collective world would be possible, as it required an order that no longer existed. What Wolfe was concerned with, as I argue Thomas was, was the survival of herself once this order had been lost. But in distinction to Wolfe, however, I believe that what Thomas was interested in was the survival of a different sort of self, one that was interdependent rather than independent, as Wolfe saw it necessary. This means that even though he recognised a change in the so-called circumstances that he thought were inevitable, he believed that something of the old order that, could not, that did not depend on the triumph of the individualistic elite could survive. The Happy Go Lucky Morgans refers back to several decades earlier than 1910, but also in its present to the immediate, to immediately after Wolfe's watershed. It demonstrated the interest in characters that Wolfe expounded, including those of minor characters, such as servants and children. I argue that Thomas's employment of these themes make more sense if you understand that the novel as a commentary on, on the present of the novel, that is to say, the vanishing utopia of Abercorn House is important, not only because of its role in shaping the character of the narrator, but because of how it signals the loss of the conditions of the present. That loss that is felt in this case is that of the interdependent selves can now only be recognised in literature. The characters of the happy-go-lucky Morgans play a significant part in conveying, though not explicitly stating Thomas's views. This would be missed if we focused only on the explicit statements of the narrator as a guide to the author's intentions. That is to say that the form of the novel allows for a playful elaboration of these themes. Perhaps it has been missed because we have sought to read Thomas's prose as we might be inclined to read his poetry, which would be as the expression of a singular point of view, which can be interpreted only by those with a similar kind of genius. Yet we know that Thomas, like his friend Robert Frost, Frost wanted to be a poet for all sorts and kinds. Fiction and dramatic poetry offered the chance to think about the way truth emerges between different points of view. This position is revealed through the relationship between the narrator and Aurelius. Arthur Foxfield, 
has by the time of telling presumably succumbed to one of the jobs as a clerk that Thomas seems to have felt he was destined for. Arthur revisits Abercorn House in the search for facts that are insufficient to bring the past to life, including the life in which his Philip, Mor Philip Morgan, his friend, has now died. Aurelius, who is also presumed dead, has no material existence, but still the ability to conjure up vanished forms of life. If Arthur is the king of the fictional kingdom, Aurelius is the Merlin, the one who gives it the power to come to life. Aurelius is described by Mr. Morgan as for today and not for an age. Like the narrator, his position is one of temporal stasis. In Aurelius's age, which is the Victorian one, he did not allow any but a working man to die of starvation unless he wants to. However, between Arthur's adult realism and Aurelius's childlike dependency, however, there seems to be the recovery of a spiritual ideal which has no place in the physical world. This idealism is revealed in both characters' love of the house that seems better than any of its individual parts, and in the servant Anne's acceptance of what cannot be changed. As Aurelius exclaimed upon hearing that the family may have to move, let the National Gallery go, let the British Museum go, but preserve the Morgans of Abercorn House. Within the walls of the house and its boiling garden, there is a sort of community of humans, animals and ideas which supports the utopian realm of heroism, poetry and wonder in turn. As Guy Cuthbertson has observed, the novel can serve not only as a valuable history of Edward Thomas, but also of the age in which he lived. As he explained, like Aurelius, the pseudonymous narrator Arthur Foxfield is in adulthood himself also a superfluous man. But it seems that he only becomes aware of this through his reflections on what had become of Aurelius. It is therefore the focus of the novel's present, in which Abercorin is now the name of a street and the Morgans have returned to Carmarthenshire, that concerns me in the rest of this talk. While many have noted that Thomas's novel serves as a record of a vanishing Victorian sense of security, represented by the idyllic Abercorin house, few have mentioned that the novel also spoke of its time of telling, which was the period just before the war. At the beginning of the novel, we are given a description of the loss of the garden, which itself, which itself seemed to anticipate changes to the situation of the characters. The generous garden to Abercorin house, known by the inhabitants as the wilderness, has been sold off as building land. Formerly the home of jackdaws and elms, its destruction seems prescient of a greater loss. And I quote, The lilies and carp are no longer in the pond, and there is no pond. I can understand people cutting down trees. It is a trade and brings profit, but not draining a pond in such a garden as the wilderness, and taking all its carp home to fry in the same fat as bloaters, all for the sake of building a house that might as well have been anywhere else or nowhere at all. Like the sold-off pigeons that return only to be reunited with their new owners by Anne, Arthur Foxfield has returned to Abercorn House in search of something that no longer exists. Instead, he is able to recall the spring he spent together with his friend Philip Morgan before Philip died through visiting the yard in which he had spent so many hours with his friend. The narrator comes to realise that he is only able to bring to life these memories through his conversations with Anne while she is caretaking it. It is this ability to care that gives Anne the chance to survive in a new house. Much more is revealed in the conversation between Arthur and the household's former servant. These conversations offer an indirect picture of Thomas's own feelings about his relationship with a new social world. It's a world in which he is likely to have felt like Aurelius that he had no place. It is in this indirect representation of Arthur's own fate where we might locate Thomas's plight. This is perhaps best conveyed in the words of David Morgan, who is the oldest son of the Morgans and has long since returned to Wales. His mother describes that in, in letters he had talked about how he had built a tower in the mountains near Larne. This was because he believed that he was the son of an alien species that had once included nymphs and fauns. They were despised by others because they lived as if time was not and yet could not be persuaded to believe in a future life. As the child of one such, Morgan could abide neither with the strange race nor with the children of Adam. This strange position produced a distinctive perspective, and I quote, 
Before he came among them, he had been thinking grandly about men without realising that these were of a different species. His own inference seemed to him impotent. They disgusted him. He wanted to make them more or less in his own image to save his feelings, which said he was absurd. He was trying to alter the conditions of other men's lives because he not, could not have himself have endured them, because it would have been unpleasant to him to be like them. Their hideous pleasure, hideous suffering, hideous indifference. While this double alienation produced a kind of madness in David Morgan, it also led to his urge to find unity amongst the greater complexity which confuses. Through moving outside of civilization into Morgan's folly, he dedicated his life to trying to discern beauty in the lives that he felt he could not understand. The same urge to discern a greater meaning and to find order is apparent in Edward Thomas, who R. George Thomas described as leading, as as tending to recoil from any form of life that was not earnest, spiritually fruitful and socially useful. Thomas's search for spiritual and social purpose seems to have been evident in his writing about Walter Pater, also in 1913. Disagreeing with his emphasis on a purely aesthetic life, which he discerned in the Victorian essays, Thomas sought instead to base his writing on lived experiences. He said, unless a man write with his whole nature concentrated on his subject, he is unlikely to take hold of another man. For a man will read not as a scholar, a philologist, a word fancier, but as a man with all his race, age, class and personal experience brought to bear on the matter. It's meant for Thomas that the writer should introduce what might be considered superfluous to another. The superfluous or common or that which was beyond immediate economic value seemed to link Thomas's aesthetic quest with his social understanding. For Thomas, the search for something outside of our immediate rational understanding is the same thing that produces the wonder of poetry. Like David Morgan, Thomas's realisation came from his experience of depression. In the ignored way, it is through the whispering, insinuating inner voice that he described haunting him in the early hours during his journey along the ignored way, that Thomas described the feeling that at some point in his adult life, he had stepped outside the order of nature. I am not a part of nature, I am alone. There is nothing else in my world but my dead heart and brain without me and the rain without. As the narrative proceeds, he explains that the conscious thought itself is what prevents him from being part of nature. And yet it is consciousness that allows him to imaginatively at least consider self-transcendence. The truth is that the rain falls forever and I am melting into it. Through imagining this other, self-transcendence becomes possible. In his essay on ecstasy and literature that he wrote shortly after the happy-go-lucky Morgans, Thomas suggested that modern psychological science may describe this as madness, but it was not how it would be experienced by the subject. The experience of ecstasy, he wrote, occurs when a man is exalted out of himself in a trance-like state. He believed that there could be no fine literature without ecstasy. The state of being outside of oneself is described in this essay as likely to produce poetry, heroism or love, but these objects were of uncertain value in Thomas's time of writing the Morgans. A value of love, poetry and heroism, which seemed to be shared by the householders and the visitors in the happy-go-lucky Morgans, seems to belong to Thomas's childhood in the last decades of the 19th century. When Mr. Morgan explained that the Victorian age would not allow any but a working man to, de man to desire of starvation unless he wanted to, Mr. Morgan seemed to reflect the emerging liberal attitude to Victorian social we welfare in which the poorest would be assisted through outdoor relief, but the working poor had to choose between fending for themselves or moving to the workhouse. But Philip and Arthur love Aurelius because he possessed skills that they admired, working with animals and telling stories but adults seemed to scorn him or to be uncomfortable around him. He is only employed on an occasional basis and he seems to have little exploitable commercial value. This attitude is summed up by Aurelius's former employer thus. What we want is efficiency. How are we to get it with the likes of this Mr. What's-His-Name anyway? 
They neither produce like the poor nor consume like the rich, and it is by production and consumption that the world goes round, I say. He was a bit of a poacher, too. I caught him myself, letting a hair out of a snare, letting it out, so he said. I said nothing to the squire, but the chap had to go. The Liberal government that was elected in 1906 started to look at the way it could ensure a strong and healthy workforce. There were a number of health measures introduced to the social causes of poverty over which people were starting to be thought of as having no control. However, in 1904, a Royal Commission sought to re-examine existing methods of dealing with idiots and epileptics and with imbecile, feeble-minded or defective persons not certified under the lunacy laws. The Commission was a result of a eugenic discourse that had gathered momentum in the years before the turn of the century. This meant that those who were unable to provide for themselves was thought of as constituting a menace to social stability. The categories of the mental defective and moral imbecility were coined for reasons that seemed both designed to assist with the social effects of those that could not look after themselves, but also to reinforce bourgeois social norms that meant those who were already struggling could risk facing new levels of difficulty. The terms mental defective and moral imbecility lacked any clear medical definition and so could not be linked to any concrete illness. From the 1870s onwards, the concepts of born criminals drawn from the poor classes who were tainted by hereditary disposition and who were incurable began to diffuse into older medical knowledge about the mentally ill. This meant that the moral attitudes combined with scientific psychiatry as it was practiced by way of the pseudosciences of hereditary de degeneration and produced the call for the enforced segre segregation and institutionalization of those who were seen as deviant. This narrowing down of the idea of normalcy was the flip side of the creation of the welfare state. Through the Mental Deficiency Act of 1913, the government had powers to detain those who were thought of as moral imbeciles in labour camps and, in si and asylums. This combination of social and medical perspectives, which has manifest in newly emerging powers of administrators, allow for the creation of a new category of human who is pathologically estranged from society. It was this discourse that seems to have inflected Thomas's discussion of Aurelius. At the same time, Thomas seems to have suggested that the deviant or the superfluous were necessary for society's spiritual flourishing. In the happy-go-lucky Morgans, when we first hear about Aurelius, it is from his former landlord and employer, and they talk about him in these terms, that there is something wrong with him and that this is possibly criminal. The narrator defended him in the following terms. When that squire's agent called his undergardener a superfluous man, he was a brute and he was wrong, but he saw straight. If we accept this label, there must always have been some superfluous men since the beginning, men whom the extravagant ingenuity of creation has produced out of sheer delight and variety, by-products of its immense processes. Sometimes I think it was one of these superfluous men who invented God and all the gods and godlets. Some of them have been killed, some enthroned, some sainted for it. But in a civilization like ours, superfluous abound and even flourish. When Thomas referred to himself as a superfluous man, he was right in the South Country and while working as a civil servant. But he stopped working as a civil servant when he started to fear that his neurasthenia, which he had previously sought treatment for, was returning. According to R. George Thomas, Thomas doubted his own efficiency and believed that he was not earning his stipend. Within the text of the South Country, Thomas describes one of his aliases talking about himself having a horror at the gap between his spiritual needs and his ability to fulfil these in meaningful employment. But as Peter Howarth has observed, superfluousness has positive associations, as that which allowed Thomas for a kind of imaginative freedom. It also seems to connect Thomas's ideas on non-human nature to human nature. Aurelius is described as showing that man is superior to other animals as an animal, and that the other superfluous characters that people's Thomas's prose, including wayfarers and itinerant workers, seem to have had a higher than average regard for the welfare of other species. Thomas himself, as we have seen, is described by R. George Thomas as having a spiritual hunger. He is constitutionally unable to seek solace in material wealth. Yet this austerity means that he was hardly able to be a happy and loving husband, let alone a happy father. It seems that it was only when he found his way to poetry that he was able to channel these impulses. Thomas was clear that 
that such ideas would be thought of as madness. And his essay on ecstasy connected these writing instincts to what might be thought of as madness. But Thomas took away the moral implications of this and looked for its practical benefits in creativity. This means that what Thomas said about Aurelius, that he was the most lightsome of men and a poet, suggested to him the value of acknowledging difference. It is only through our openness to alternative values to our own, after all, that we can develop our own sense of virtue. Calming us with its space and patience, the country relates us all to eternity. We go to it as would-be poets or as solitary vagabonds, lovers, to escape foul air, noise, hard hats, black uniforms, multitudes, confusion, incompleteness, elaborate means without clear ends, to escape ourselves, and we do more than escape them. So vastly do we increase the circle of which we are the centre that we become as nothing. The larger the circle, the less seems our distance from each other, from other men, each at his separate centre, and at last that distance is nothing at all in the mighty circle, and all have but one circumference. And thus we truly find ourselves. So even if we don't understand other people's motivations or could consider them rational, there is a value for Thomas in behaving as though they have intentions. It is through this way that we increase the circle of our associations. This seems to be the attitude that Thomas advocates towards non-human nature, and it is this attitude that is shown by Aurelius, who is fired for releasing a hair from a trap. Thomas shows us that if we only focus on efficiency, we will miss not only a broader spiritual perspective on our lives, but risk undermining our own chances of survival. Thomas suggested that the rational efficiency that was so valued by his peers was unlikely to allow for our physical, let alone our spiritual survival. As he wrote earlier in the South Country, how little do we know of the business of the earth, not to speak of the universe, of time, not to speak of eternity. It was not by taking thought that man survived the mastodon. The acts and thoughts that will serve the race that will profit this commonwealth of things that live in the sun, the air, the earth, the sea, now and all through time, are not known and never will be known. The rumour of much toil and scheming and triumph may never reach the stars, and what we value not at all, are not conscious of, may break the surface of eternity with endless ripples of good. We know not by what we survive. In this talk I've discussed Edward Thomas's 1913 novel The Happy-Go-Lucky Morgans in the context of his other works from the years immediately before the World War I, including his other autobiographical works. I focus on Edward Thomas's character of Aurelius the Superfluous Man as a way of thinking through the obstacles he saw to writing about himself as himself. I argue that this was because at the time of writing, the country was experiencing a panic over a fear of moral degeneracy, which was the flip side of the creation of a welfare state and the liberal progressivism that Thomas grew up with. By creating Aurelius and his other alter egos in Philip Morgan, Arthur Foxfield and David Morgan, Thomas saw that being outside of common systems of value provided his characters, as it did himself, with greater recognition of human independence, human interdependence, including with other species. This recognition provided us with an understanding of why the novel deserves greater recognition than it has hitherto received, and why Thomas speaks especially to those of us who, do, who wish to develop an ethics of care and interdependent selves. Thank you for joining us for this talk. A live Q&A session with Anna Stilling will soon start on Zoom, a link to which will shortly follow.